come on down. Let me, let me uh, get these good people down here. All right, sorry to get started so late. We'll, we'll all just try to speak faster. Um, welcome to the Under the Radar Symposium, edition 10. <laughs> That was Jay Duckworth, the man who piped us in, who is, his day job is, uh, is our prop master here at uh, PS120. At, at, <laughs> oh, bad news. It's jet lag, it's jet lag. Uh, he's the public theater's uh, prop master. You'd think I'd learn after like 10 years, but no. Um, anyway, uh, this is our 10th edition. It feels like only yesterday we were all gathered in the then new St. Anne's Warehouse space. Uh, but here we are now. I can't believe it. And we're making a big celebration of that. I hate celebrations and birthdays, but we're going to make a big de deal out of this one. Who is, I want to see hands or stand up if you're uh, an under the radar virgin. You've only been here this year. All right. Oh, good. That's good. That's a good reason. Good, good. Um, people have been here two years. Stand. Oh, okay. Two years, you don't have to stand. Uh, three years. Three years. Okay. Four. Wow. Five. Nice. Five years. Uh, six. Seven. No one came the seventh year. Eight. <laughs> And nine and ten. Who's been here for ten? Stand up! Oh, that's great! That's a lot of suffering. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, this year, I have a uh, co-director of the festival. Uh, yes, the amazing Megan Wong. And this might be the first year that we've allowed her to see the full symposium. <laughs> um, please welcome me in, and um, I'll be back in two years. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Oh. Hello. This is what 280 of you look like, I guess. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Under the Radar into the January season, and uh, welcome to the 10th edition of the festival. I'm uh, eight years. Uh, Under the Radar is supported by major gifts from the Lewester T. Mertz Charitable Trust, the Ford Foundation, the Leon Lowenstein Foundation, Select Equity, and the W Trust. Uh, and we also really want to acknowledge our supporters who have really been there for us uh, the last 10 years. The Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Doris Duke Charitable Trust, Altria, the Trust for Mutual Understanding, Niska, Jim Henson Foundation, and all of our individual donors and supporters. And of course, we want to especially thank our wonderful staff at the Public Theater, and uh, <coughs> Susan Feldman and St. Anne's Warehouse for hosting the very first Under the Radar. And of course, our small and mighty Under the Radar team, which includes our associate producer, Andrew Kircher, <laughs> and our program assistant, Lily Lamb Atkinson. <laughs> And finally, we could not have done this without the deep support of the institution that has been our home for nine of the 10 years, the Public Theater. And, uh, and I would like to introduce you to the Executive Director of the Public Theater, Mr. Patrick Willingham. Uh, Patrick's first show in his uh, tenure was last year's Under the Radar, which is a kind of a big hello. And he comes to the public from our neighbors across the street, the Blue Man, uh, group where he was the pr president and chief operating officer for the 16 years and he has really transformed the public in his short time and it has been a true true pleasure working with him and so please welcome Patrick Willing. Hey everybody welcome 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 I just want to echo both Mayan and, and Mark's sentiments it's fantastic uh, to have everyone here for the 10th edition I poked my head out. I saw those of you who have been here for 10 years. It's a, it's a large group of folks, right? 
Um, you know, up until this morning, I only had one uh, under the radar story that I was going to share with you, but I'm delighted to tell you that I have two very, very brief stories. Um, the first was, you know, as, as you know, the staff and I were wending our way through a very noisy crowd gathered in our lobby, um, I, I ended up riding up in the elevator with Heidi Griffiths, who's our casting director here, and she's been with us for over 20 years. And she just turned to me and said, I just have to tell you, Patrick, I have seen some of the most extraordinary theater in my entire life at this festival. Right? Absolutely right. And I think that that's the thing that's made some of you come back time and time and time and time and time and time and time, time, time again. Um, and what has drawn some of you here the first time. And my other story is from the complete opposite end of the spectrum. It's from my husband, um, who uh, is not really a theater guy. I, I, I drag him along. Just this week, I, I took him to Twelfth Night of, uh, with Mark Rylance, and uh, he said to me, could we, could we only see Shakespeare at the public, babe? It's like, all right, all right. But the first year that I was the executive director, I brought him to some of the Under the Radar shows, um, and he turned to me after the first couple of shows, and he just had this huge grin on his face, and he said to me, oh, these are my people, <laughs> which I totally, totally loved. And I think for all of us sitting in this room now, there's a real sense that the work that gets presented at Under the Radar, the work that gets presented in festivals similar to this, in this country, in New York right now, all around the world, is something that speaks to all of us in a way that, that helps us understand, these are my people. And uh, that sense is something that the public has, uh, I think, really taken to the forefront of our overall mission. You know, it, it's pretty extraordinary that almost a decade ago, um, Oscar Eustis decided to take poor old Mark Russell in from the cold um, and, and bring him from St. Anne's to the hallowed island of Manhattan. Um, but it, I think it was a really extraordinary move um, for each of them. Uh, and I think it was uh, a real risk, but also I think rather extraordinary that we would house this festival of devised theater works from all around the world and from the United States here at the Public Theater. And to make a, a, an ongoing statement that this place is a home for not just a specific playwright-driven work, isn't just a home for musicals, isn't just a home for Shakespeare, but is a home for all sorts of um, theater. Everything that falls under the, underneath the umbrella of theater belongs here at the public. So from that moment eight years ago, you know, you, you fast forward to now, we now have Mayan Wong, the extraordinary Mayan Wong, who is uh, now the co-director with Mark of this festival while he uh, sort of starts our European outpost. Um, not really, but kind of. Um, and the, the, the thing that we've decided to do as a public theater, which I'm really excited to, to uh, just talk to you very briefly about, is to really put an institution's muscle behind supporting the creation of, of devised theater works. So as Mark said, Maine's not only the co-director of the festival, but she's also the director of our devised theater initiative. And over the past six months, she's been working on a three-year plan that will put the public's muscle firmly behind uh, creating resources, tools, and space for devised theater artists to develop their work. You know, I think we're all really aware, particularly those of us in the United States, that there's uh, a great deal of support, or I should probably say has been historically a great deal of support um, in the rest of the world for the creation of this sort of work. Uh, but there hasn't necessarily been a lot of support here in the US, and it's something that we at the public are very excited uh, about creating. So uh, as I said, our intent is to create a space. Our intent is to give device theater artists the support and the resource that they need in order to develop the work so that beyond the walls of, of the public, beyond the walls of just these festivals that celebrate and encourage this sort of work, that this work is actually better accepted, better taken into the whole of uh, the American theater, and that's just something we're extraordinarily excited about. I think I've said enough, but I'm really happy to have you all here. I am looking forward uh, to a great many shows over the next uh, week and a half, and I hope you have a terrific day uh, here at the symposium into tomorrow. So enjoy, it's been a pleasure, thank you. Hi, thank you.
Patrick. Um, now I would like to introduce Mario Garcia Durham, uh, the CEO of the uh, um, uh, Association of Performing Arts Presenters. Under the Radar was a product of APAP for many years. I have known Mario for many years at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, and now leading APAP. He has always been a strong supporter of new theater, and it is a pleasure to welcome to the stage to say a few words. Thank you. Mario. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, Mark started out this session doing something that's completely unacceptable to presenters, and that's by throwing candy to the audience to win their affection. <laughs> I'm going to throw dollars out. To <laughs> uh, no, but don't worry, that's not a pet money, that's my leftover money from my time at the NEA. <laughs> Sincerely thank uh, Mark and Mayen and Patrick and Oscar and all of the folks here who make this possible. I also want to give a round of applause. I'm, you know, I'm in conference mode, so our volunteers and staff that meet us at the door really help out. So I'd love to give a round of applause to all of you. As, uh, as Mark said, uh, um, APAP uh, is very happy to be in partnership um, with this project and organization. And uh, we're very happy to announce this event as part of our pre-conference uh, event lineup. But I did want to uh, mention as well, uh, can I have another round of applause for the 10th year anniversary of this fantastic uh, festival? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a couple of things. Um, I wanted to um, thank Mark. Uh, um, he's such a, a great leader and colleague. Uh, he contacted me about a year ago. Uh, one of the issues that I faced at APAP and would always come up with a board is like, oh my God, you have APAP and then you have all these other festivals and events that are, you know, blossoming around APAP and, you know, it's going to pull audience, all of that stuff, which you're all aware of. I come from the school, as many of you do, that it's like this, uh, uh, working together, we're much stronger. So when Mark called me about Let's all work together with all of the festivals. It, it landed on open ears, and I'm very happy to give him credit that this year we're working as a pilot project um, with seven other festivals and events that are going on under the radar, Global Fest, Coil, Focus, Winter Jazz Fest, Prototop, Prototype, and a number of others, um, because we firmly believe that working together we will all rise here. So I'm really, really happy that we're doing that, we're cross-promoting, because we think this month in January is an amazing time of arts performing arts professionals coming here to see and experience work. So I want to give Mark credit for the initiative of all of us working together, and it's just going to grow. So I wanted to thank Mark for that. And then finally, I wanted to acknowledge a dear friend who <coughs> actually made this all possible as well, and that is Olga Garay English. <laughs> As you all know, she's an amazing individual, an amazing colleague, and without her foresight and wisdom and support, uh, this, not, this would not have happened. So I want to remind you all that tomorrow we have the uh, APAP Under the Radar Speed Dating from 9 until noon, and I wish you all a fantastic symposium. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. We're gonna uh, skip housekeeping. You all know what to do anyway. Um, but I wanna go right into from where I stand. Now last year we asked four of our artists in the festival to give a mini manifesto based on their perspective on the world. You can find Taylor Mack's text on one of the walls in our upstairs club. This year we have asked four arts and activists, administrators, curators to do the same. A simple and difficult little assignment what is their view of what is going on in the world? What is their experience? What concerns them? What gives them joy? And how do they view the future of theater? So from where I stand. Uh, there's been a small change in the program. Anna Mae Van Acker, who's the artistic director and managing director of the uh, How Hevel am Ufer in Berlin, sends her regrets she was not able to make it. She had one of those board meeting things. It's terrible. Anyway. Um, our first speaker 
is Olga Gray English. Um, let's see, here's my notes. Here we go. Olga has made such an impact on American culture from wherever she has found herself. At Miami Dade as a presenter and an NPN um, member, uh, where I first met her, uh, to her time at the Doris Duke Foundation, where she was my main co-conspirator in starting Under the Radar, to her last uh, job as ED of the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural <laughs> Affairs, where she helped bring our particular formula of festival to create Radar LA. Um, I'm proudly honored to bring to the stage <laughs> Olga Gray English, still the sexiest arts <laughs> practitioner I know. <laughs> Olga! <laughs> Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to uh, show some slides, I think. Um, I want to talk about what brought me to this kind of work. Um, Egon Schiele was an, Australian, uh, an Austrian expressionist artist of the early 20th century. He was at odds with critics and society for much of his life and briefly was incarcerated for obscenity. Next. <laughs> John Kelly is a contemporary artist from New York City who fluidly uses the tools of performance to draw a haunting portrait of Sheila, who died at 28 during an influenza epidemic that crippled Europe. I first encountered this work at Dance Theater Workshop in 1986 it was the evocative portrayal of Egon Schiele's life and artistry called Pass the Butworth Vita. Coming from Miami before Art Basel, before even the uh, ubiquitous uh, Art Deco movement was really brought back to life, I had never really seen theater such as this. I had seen standard theater and musicals and, you know, um, you know second-rate kind of Shakespeare stuff, um, and, uh, and I'd never seen anything like this. And I was sitting next to David White, who has been such a pioneer um, in terms of bringing this kind of work to audiences that I, I was just mesmerized. Um, John was able to bring a simple, concise, and gripping tale, barely using any language. He did it through imagery, through music, and dance. Artists who tell tales that I can embody and that taste um, just permeates my soul really seduce me into doing the kind of work that I do, and that is playing a role in helping work get developed and then sharing it with audiences like you. I respond to artist-centric work, work that reveals hidden truths sometimes shining a light on a lone individual, sometimes mirroring the strength and pathos of entire peoples. Strong work that can be found in your own community, but, it, but that is in dialogue with national and, and international community. I'm interested in artists who represent the diversity of those communities, geographic diversity, gender diversity, sexual preference, cultural, ethnicity. Um, all of those kinds of artists really are in the moment and are really the harbingers of truths. People like Carl Hancock Rux, Pat Graney, Ping Chong, Randy Eckert, Luis Alfaro, and Culture Quest <coughs> from Los Angeles where I now live, Urban Bush Women, these are all artists that have played a major role in keeping me engaged with this kind of work, and I hope that I have been able to nurture some of their work as well. I'm also driven by my commitment to breaking the xenophobic practices of this country and internationalizing the fields of presenting and theater. Um, and, and the combination of all of those factors really evidence initially in, in how I responded to John Kelly's portrayal of Egon Sheila are what brought me to Under the Radar. Um, we 
are here celebrating the 10th anniversary of this fantastic and pathbreaking festival. I'm proud to say that we were able to launch Radar LA uh, Festival two years ago and, and has brought similar um, questions and, and truths to our own community. Both have been labors of love that have brought countless artists and audience members together in communion. And I also want to just give a shout out to the many of us who work year after year to make these encounters possible. From where I stand, it is necessary to recommit to this work and to continue bringing these stories to life through difficult periods and through periods of prosperity. I celebrate under the radar and hope to meet you here again in 10 years. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. And now, I'd like to welcome to the stage Joe Hodge. Joe is an actor, a director, an artistic leader, and currently the producing artistic director of Playmakers Repertory in North Carolina. One of our agendas at Under the Radar, and we have many agendas, was to invite to the table leaders from the American Regional Producing Theaters. And Joe's honesty, curiosity, and deep integrity has been one of the pleasures of this journey for me. He is one of the people showing us how to remake the American theater for the future. Please welcome Joe Hawk. so bright out here, they keep us in the dark out there, and it's, it's kind of close. Uh, a huge thanks to, uh, to Mark and to Mayan, uh, who are two of my favorite people in the American theater, uh, extraordinary thinkers, um, uh, extraordinary practitioners, and uh, I'm honored to be speaking to all of you, and I'm flattered to be invited to your party. Uh, my father and I fought tooth and nail about my desire to go to graduate school to become an actor. Partly because my parents were immigrants from Palestine and there were only three jobs for the children of immigrants from Palestine, doctor, lawyer, or engineer. But mostly because my father was given to understand by talking with some folks that the theater was dying. I was reminded of those conversations from so many years ago when I read an article last week about the theater as a dying art form due to the threat of our on-demand world. I also read this recently from an important person of the theater lamenting the demise of the field. <clears throat> I quote, I question the utility of turning out every year some thousands of young people who are qualified to teach drama, the overwhelming majority of whom are hoping to get on the staff of a college where they hope to teach succeeding, ever multiplying thousands to teach drama. That quote is from Tyrone Guthrie's A New Theater, written in 1964. <laughs> I have never seen anything take so long to die. <laughs> we can't even come up with new reasons why the theater is dying. Our business has been around for at least 2,000 years, and it's doing beautifully in its typically shaggy way. Uh, we're told that we need to innovate and adapt in order to survive. We could teach a clinic on the subject. <laughs> you know what the business world learned 20 years ago that was innovative? They learned that it doesn't make sense to hire people and make them do the exact same job for 35 years. They learned that they were far nimbler and smarter if they worked on a project-specific basis, put a small team together for a particular project, each team member bringing skills very specific to the demands of said project, then disbanding the team once that project was finished. In other words, innovatively discovering a way of working that we've been doing since antiquity. For 2,000 years, we've adapted to change. We do it better than anyone. If I had to bet on who might be here 2,000 years from now, the theater or television, radio, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, the GOP, Christianity, or Miley Cyrus fans, I'd bet on the theater. <laughs> And we have to be careful that our desire to be innovative and entrepreneurial, two words that I'd be happy to see banished from the lexicon, doesn't encourage us to compromise the thing that is unique and extraordinary about what we do. A couple of years ago, Playmakers allowed tweeting from a section of the audience, and it felt silly to me, and we stopped, because in our world where it seems that every single person has a blog, 
further evidence that the unlived life is not worth examining. And selfies, <laughs> and selfies that must be taken and shared with everybody we've ever known. I think one of the single most radical acts a community can perform is for 500 people in agreement with one another to turn off their cell phones and sit in a dark room together to listen to someone else's story. I don't know. I don't know that we have to innovate in order to save a theater which is not dying. I, I do think we need to be braver. I think we have to invite bigger artists to join us. I think we need to make room for one another. I think we should work with a generosity and joy that comes from working in a discipline which is indeed so durable and indestructible. The art form is about the closest thing we've got to a sure thing. It survived the plague, civil wars, world wars, the flu pandemic, depressions and recessions. It has survived everything and it will surely survive whatever damage you or I do to it. So uh, capital T theater, I have no worries about. That said, each of our individual theaters or presenting organizations are extraordinarily fragile and vulnerable entities and dependent on the continued support of the communities which they serve. And I just wonder, and, I, and of course I don't, I don't know, but I wonder if that fragility, while anathema to our corporate culture, is exactly right for us. Be relevant all the time or go away every year, every day, to question whether we are relevant enough, whether we are important enough for our community to engage with us and care for us. That fragility somehow seems right to me. And though it leaves us feeling anxious and destabilized, we have to stop acting like that fragility is somehow evidence of the failure of the art form or of the sector. And, and I think it is this chicken little mentality, this the sky is falling, mentality that creates such a sense of scarcity that contributes to this sense that anything that is good for you is somehow something that is being taken away from me and this contributes to our main failing as a field which is how we take insufficient care of one another if we can leave aside all of our orthodoxies, all of our insistence that the kind of work we make is the only kind of work that ought to be made if we can think of the theater as a single ecosystem, which it surely is, then to say companies that make devised work are struggling is a lot like saying there's a leak in your side of the boat. You know, for, for a field that celebrates itself around ideas of inclusion, we sure love our little fiefdoms. And we operate from such a place of fear and conservatism. For all of us in this room who run an arts organization, we are going to be fired from our job or we will retire at some point to the great relief of our organization and our community. <laughs> Those are the only two ways out besides quitting or dying at our desk. People will come to despise us or at least grow tired of us because that's what people do. Our leadership career has a lifespan and it may turn out to be, and maybe should be, shorter than we'd like. And so faced with such career mortality, what are we doing? You know, Peter Sellers once said to me, uh, the trick is to do as much as you can, as fast as you can, before they figure out what you're up to and throw you out of the building. <laughs> and I, I think there's something to that. Make as much art as you can now. Invite as many artists into your building now as you can. Make the work that you have to make before they throw you out. I'm, I'm truly bored with all of our orthodoxies and competition about who is making more meaningful work, and I don't want to argue about any of that. But the question I will pose to all of us is, are we making the work that we most want and need to make? Or are we making some other kind of work? while waiting for the economy to recover, the audience to come, the board to step up, the foundation to embrace us, the NEA to recognize us. What are we waiting for? Better times? These are better times. This might be as good as it ever gets, right now. And a fear-based scarcity mindset that invites us to hunker down, think small, share nothing with anybody, have no courage until some imagined better day, in fact, pushes us towards the very demise which we are trying to avoid. My job is not to ensure that Playmakers uses its resources to build a bomb shelter in its backyard in preparation against some imagined apocalypse. 
My job is to make as much art as I can right now, as well as I know how, and connect that work meaningfully to the community which I am charged to serve. And interestingly, that's turned out to be a pretty sound business model for us. Last night, we opened Mike Daisy's The Story of the Gun at Playmakers. We commissioned the piece from Mike because we thought that a nation of 300 million people and 300 million guns is a domestic question of some urgency and relevance, and that our cultural addiction to guns is worthy of interrogation. We just closed a rotating rep that I co-directed with Dominique Sarand of The Tempest and Metamorphoses. I chose to work on those plays with Dominique, not because we think in the same way and value the same things, but because we don't, which grew our company and our community meaningfully. Outside of our producing season at Playmakers, we've got Taylor Mack, Rachel Chavkin, and the team in residence this summer continuing work on a future project. We also have the Rude Mechs coming in to work on a new piece. With help from the Mellon Foundation, we give room and time and salary and administrative support and leverage the intellectual capital of the university, all in support of devising companies. It isn't the work we make at Playmakers. We don't want the premiere. We don't want subsidiary rights. We just want to be helpful because we are in the same boat. And having those artists in our building makes us bigger and makes our entire community stronger. I'll leave you with this final thought. I was in the first City Company production over 20 years ago. Uh, Ann Bogart directed Chuck Mee's Orestes. We built it in Togamura, Japan, using a system called Viewpoints. Talking to other artists at the time about the approach, they thought we were all from Mars. Nobody knew what it was. Now Viewpoints is on actors' resume the way that jazz or tap used to be. Our edges roll in towards the center, and we make a terrific mistake if we are not nurturing those artists and companies who make work in ways that we don't immediately understand or at first blush even know how to fully appreciate. And so I encourage you to make the work that you most need to make. Choose people who are unlike you. Choose people who work in paradigms other than your own. Choose generosity. Choose love. Make room. There is truly such abundance. Thank you very much. Uh, so when Annalee Van Acker um, had to drop out earlier this week, I told her, kind of a, as punishment, that I was going to ask Mark Yeoman to impersonate her, and that we were preparing her wig right now. I'm sure Mark could kill in a wig, but uh, he brings to us today a different perspective we do not get enough of in this country. That is one from across the pond. Mark is the artistic director of the Nordeson Festival in Groningen, Holland, a little college town two hours by train up from Amsterdam. I recommend that you put the Nordeson Festival on your list of festivals to experience. It is a wonderful combination of uh, state fair, I mean, there's meat on a stick, um, <laughs> Battle of the Bands, and experimental dance in theater and performance art and installation. Um, he has done wonders for American artists and exposed me to many artists from around the world with his amazing eye. Please welcome Mark Young. Good morning, and considering the journeys that uh, some of you will be making to be here today, it might be good afternoon or even good evening. Yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, I'm sorry not to be enemy, I was looking forward to hearing her speak also myself. Um, Mark thought they should choose someone who looked a bit like her. <laughs> I haven't had time since yesterday to prepare speech as such, uh, which is probably good news. <laughs> but I do promise that uh, there will be, in what I have to say, at least one secret, uh, because I think that all good speeches should contain at least one secret. <laughs> really. <laughs> so I, um, I, am, uh, I'm, I grew up in Britain, and 
I uh, grew up in Britain and didn't stay there. I left when I was 25, and since then I've been working, living in uh, continental Europe, uh, or Europe, as the British call it. <laughs> a number of countries, and um, it's been quite interesting doing a sort of a 25-year extended interrail around Europe, different countries, Germany, Belgium, France, Spain, now the Netherlands. Um, and uh, growing up in Britain, I, I used to like making theatre, but I was always having fun with it because theatre was such a serious thing. Theatre was, um, theatre was intellectualising, theatre was Shakespeare, theatre was beautiful voices, theatre was um, mainly white middle class kids going to a London school, <coughs> Lambda, Rada, one of them and learning how to do working class accents that would be really good on the BBC. And I'm quite happy that since then much has changed in the world. Theatre uh, is no longer this uh, narrow band. Theatre has grown uh, to be this much bigger thing than just that man, narrow band. And uh, I'm delighted as an adult to discover that and now to work within this broader vision of theatre and to celebrate that with everything that I'm able to do. I am the artistic director of a festival called the Nordeson in Groningen in the north of the Netherlands. It's a small city like Mark was saying, 200,000 people, 300,000 bicycles. <laughs> and. Uh, what we did there, it really wasn't much of a, it wasn't an ambitious kind of a place when I arrived in 2001. It was a very self-contented place, uh, a beautiful summery feel and so on. And, uh, but uh, since then we've done an unlikely thing. We've uh, added in um, a lot of, uh, I would say, he heavy, heavier content on the program whilst keeping the basic form of the festival. And you know what? No one has a problem because people changed also. Uh, I joke sometimes, I say, folks ain't so stupid. They, they, they don't have a problem uh, following what people might say, oh, that's difficult. No, it's not. It's difficult if it's not well made. <laughs> if it's well made, it's not difficult. Because really, the underlying secret of our festival, I would say, is that um, <laughs> my, my only theatre book of reference is actually Desmond Morris, Man Watching. I don't know if you know Desmond Morris. <laughs> he wrote The Naked Ape, a zoologist who started studying us as if we're animals. Uh, the Naked Ape, uh, the, the less um, intellectual version of his work is called Man Watching. It's about us as uh, an animal. Uh, 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 descended from ape become a thing called Homo sapiens. We are a 200,000 year old observer survivor species, and that's what you're doing now. You're ob observing me, observing someone's phone, observing everything, <laughs> observing the movement of my hands, <coughs> seeing everything, hearing what else is happening in the room. That's what we do. We do it uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because that's what we are inside. Uh, we are fabulously good observers. And I've attempted to put on stage at our festival work which is as intelligent as the audience that will be sitting in front of it. And actually, the audience really likes that because the audience doesn't really like being insulted. The audience doesn't like the idea that somebody thought they might not be able to cope with something. Mark asked me to say something about the theatre today and in the future. About the theatre today, um, I would say, I see three real tendencies. Uh, Society with the internet becomes quite rapidly less uh, vertical and much more horizontal. <coughs> Please let's not confuse uh, wealth 
which is as vertical as it ever was, with thinking, which is becoming extremely horizontal. Uh, we as people become much more complex than the idea of us until recently. There were people like theater, other people like dance, other people like music. We all know that that's not us. We like theater and dance and music. We also like Game Boys and watching Bruce Willis films when it's too much stress to go out to the theater. Because uh, it's really who we are these days. We become much more broad, much more open, the influences on our lives, the, the things which we're interested in. You, you are uh, arts or science, that's no longer us. We are arts or sports, that's no longer us. Rapidly, we become much more uh, broad, we, we are uh, more multiple. So I, I think this will affect the work that's interesting on a stage as well. Um, and that's what I see in the, a lot of the work that's being made by artists these days, um, much more horizontal. Um, I'd like to, uh, it's a bit of a crime to put post in front of anything, I know, but I'm going to do it. I'd like to talk about post-international. Um, I'm aware, I'm a European, I work in a, a small cluster of countries in Europe. Um, but there's sort of an obsession with the idea of uh, international, as if it has some special quality to it. It's almost a sort of a category. Uh, it, it's not a category or a genre. Uh, it, doesn't really, it's, uh, it doesn't really mean much anymore, because people these days are not so interested in where your shirt was made, uh, the music you listen to on Spotify, where it's from, which country it's from, uh, which, what was the nationality of the the company that made the seats that you're sitting on. People are not thinking like this. Uh, we, we really are, are moving on quite quickly. The idea that national identities can be encapsulated uh, within the things which politicians wish sometimes or funding structures wish for sometimes to reflect national um, quality or identity. I don't think that's who, what, what people are thinking at the moment. I don't think people, I don't think we're thinking like that. I think that we don't really care so much. I think we care about whether it feels relevant uh, to us. Uh, it's, uh, so my feeling at the moment is that there's uh, uh, slowly less interest in, we, we, we tend to produce nationally and present internationally, but who cares? Um, it's, uh, I don't know how it works for you here in the States, uh, but the idea of, oh, this is American. I mean, your own country is a nation of nations, uh, many different influences. Uh, which bit of America are we talking about? Uh, you know, so we are influenced by culture, uh, not nationhood. And culture is an ancient thing that we carry within us from many different places. Uh, so post-internationalism, uh, that's my, it's very European kind of a plea. And also, um, post-contemporary, uh, post um, I've avoided using the word either international or contemporary around my festival because the word contemporary scared me away from it for a long, long time. The idea you've got to be able to talk about it afterwards, that's scary. Um, and contemporary actually doesn't mean modern. Uh, contemporary is a movement. Contemporary is specific. It's a term borrowed out of visual arts and uh, music and now to stage work. Con contemporary doesn't mean from now. Contemporary is specific in style. And I'm personally at the moment very, very interested in breaking away from the dogmas of contemporary idiom into what might come after that. That might include work that's not adhering to those dogmas, coming from different places, different uh, ways of thinking. Maybe it doesn't have to be uh, deconstructed. We don't have to. Um, maybe it doesn't need to start at the end and go to the beginning. It, it, it's okay to do it the right way around. It. People <laughs> don't think, really care. That what matters is that it's well made, it's respectful, and it, it's aware of the fact that the, the people who it would be told to 
uh, is, uh, members of a 200,000 year old survivor observer species and it needs to feel relevant uh, in, in this day. To wrap up about something about the future, I'd like to just echo one or two things that Joe Hansch was just saying there. Um, and uh, I, was, I was in Athens uh, a couple of months ago and I went to visit the, the Parthenon. I don't know how many of you have been there. It's an uh, ancient city and still up on the big hill in the middle there's the, uh, the temple and a lot of stones that fell down, we put them back up again. Uh, the ones that the British didn't take away to Britain. And, uh, uh, so I was wandering around and it was beautiful. Blue sky, around, it sort of felt ancient and old and so on. And um, until I came to uh, the theater of Dionysus, and to explain the theater of Dionysus was uh, built a couple of thousand years ago and it's, uh, it's basically a, a, a Guthrie thrust stage, <laughs> 2,000 years before Tara and Guthrie. And it's got a little wall that goes around and people sit around it. And this is my secret, I promised you a secret. My secret is I almost cried because it was the only thing in that place that still felt familiar to me. Uh, because it just was very immediate. It's a theatre, people stand and tell. And so for the future, I imagine that in 2,000 years from now, much, much would have changed in society, how we live. We will have become as unrecognisable to us now as we would be now to the Greeks that sat in that theatre. I do believe that the theatre they will be making in 2,000 years will be extremely recognizable to us because uh, we don't evolve that fast. The audience is still going to be homo sapiens. It's still going to be homo sapiens watching other homo sapiens uh, telling stories in a homo sapiens kind of way. And so for me, the, the theater uh, performing arts, I think that it will be one of the very few things that we will still recognize in 2000 years from now. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Our final uh, presenter today is um, Mark Bamuthi Joseph. Mark was the first artist to perform at Under the Radar, I believe. Uh, I think we made him do a version of his classic piece, Word Becomes Flesh, at 10 in the morning that January. Uh, two years ago, we did the group work of Word Becomes Flesh, and many of you saw that. It's amazing. He recently uh, came to the dark side and joined the world of presenters. And uh, he is the artistic director of the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. Uh, he is bringing to that role the same genre-breaking honesty and passion that we know so well in his performances. Please welcome Mark Vanuthi Gerson. Shit up. It's still here. <laughs> cool. um, so, from where I stand, fun topic. Um, I wish I could tell you where I'm standing, but I'm dancing. I'm an immediate product of an immediate past. Two years ago, I premiered a dance theater piece at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. The show went up on a Thursday, and the following Monday, I had my first interview for the job of Director of Performing Arts at the same institution. I like to joke that there was a poster of myself in the room that I was interviewing in. Um, <laughs> this may or may not have been an asset in the interview room, because who trusts artists at art centers? 
the piece itself was a performed documentary of three years spent working on sustainability issues across African America. Um, we developed intentional communities um, who collaborated on a festival meant to illuminate sustainable survival practices in under-resourced neighborhoods in Chicago, in Houston, Harlem, and Oakland. Theastergates designed a set for us that functioned like an up-purposed sleeve for the narrative skin of the piece. On tour, we talked about keeping new resources in the community of moving up but not moving out. We talked about the politics of staying. Three months into my gig at Yerba Buena, I received an inaugural Doris Duke Performing Artist Award. At our orientation session, Duke President Ed Henry looked us square in the eye and reminded us all that we were so honored for our work as artists, us jazz musicians, dancers, designers, and actors, us weird people, us culture hackers. Don't stop making work, he implored, which was an admonition and a little bit of a warning. And so, um, my next three works are a hybrid opera for the Philadelphia Opera Company, a play in verse for South Coast Rep, and a dance theater piece about global economies told through the lens of soccer's World Cup. The ghosts still keep waking me up in the middle of the night and moving my pen. And so, here I stand mostly on a fault line in a blue state. Three blocks from the ghetto, six blocks to Twitter's office, eight blocks from the bridge to Oakland. One week in October, Apple will launch a new product into the world from my theater, and the next week, Sankai Juku or Bill T. Jones will launch from the same stage. I imagine each person in this room is a little bit of everywhere at once. To be of art and commerce and politic, we have to be. My specific everywhere is everything stated above. I'm an artist with a particular civic duty. I love performing because of the agency it affords me. Hi. <laughs> oh, that's all good. We just, at this point, it's just me, right? <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> there was some fresh shit. I had naked people. It was great. <laughs> But you know, <laughs> I love performing because of the agency it affords me to self-transform and also to impel movement among others. I love curating because of those same principles, transformation and social movement. And so I stand of the belief that contemporary art centers exist on an axis somewhere between the academic and the entrepreneurial. My boss, uh, Deborah Cullinan, talks the way Octavia Butler does sometimes, talks about all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. She says, let's think about something other than getting people to our space. Let's think about how we are changed through the multivalent members in our community. So from where I stand and in reconciliation of a moment of social practice, performance, passion, and field of inquiry, I'm engaged with a curatorial activism that centers on the art of making environments for relationship. I've developed um, an audience development mechanism based on the cultivation of creative ecosystems that we call the Future Soul Think Tank. Um, just as universities provide the perimeters for small discipline-based colleges, so too I believe that contemporary art centers can hold intentional pedagogical space to uphold programmatic values. Um, the core philosophy behind the Future Soul Think Tank is the cultivation of cross-sections of the Bay Area's creative class intentionally using our institutional space as thought lab, harnessing a quorum of generative energy and nurturing it. The group began fairly small, about 30 people. They came from Stanford, Harvard, Berkeley. They're Apple software developers, civil rights lawyers, playwrights, authors, rock star chefs, rock stars. We gave them memberships to our institution, uh, free tickets to certain events, quarterly academic meetings. But most importantly, we gave these folks our building, and we asked them to generate reflections on a big idea in our institutional space. Um, we also asked that each subsequent meeting, they individually invited one person who had yet to attend a gathering, but definitely should have been um, integrated into the cohort. So the group has both social and productive import. We're not developing an audience, we're cultivating a future and selecting a key group to make it with us. We project that the way to develop an audience is to seed it with offstage thinkers who will then pull in their constituencies to our organization around big questions and not just beautiful content. Um, the big question that we asked this first group is what is soul going to look like in 
the year 2038. Um, we then gave them physical space and an online platform to manifest answers to that question. Um, over the next several years, we'll concurrently convene other ecosystems around other big questions so that when we presented the work of Young Jean Lee, she and her company aren't the only ones that are actively present in codifying an inquiry around the body, gender, post-feminist definitions of post-feminist inclinations. We have a creative ecosystem that's been convening for a year, reflecting on two questions. Um, what is on the other side of your body's joy? What is on the other side of your body's shame? The Body Politics cohort um, will build and present immersive participatory interventions around the YBCA campus in response to these questions, creating a contextual gallery of installations, an immersive foyer to prime the audience experience for Untitled Feminist Show, activating our belief that YBCA is a place for the public to provoke thought, not just to witness art. It is an institutional practice that mirrors the prologue of the piece I happen to premiere there, and it also mirrors the cadre of of artists who are um, designing work that begins beyond the lip of the stage, that are resolutely attempting to reconcile the pedestrian space with the perform space and developing work for everywhere but the theater itself. This is a dance with theater itself resourcing public intellectuals, having shared process within the frame of art space, citizen art as ecosystem and introduction, the transposition of cultures through careful and curated systems of invitation. It's a reframing of the plaguing question, considering civic development rather than audience development, the location of urban growth inside of the architecture of theater. And likewise, my institution has integrated artist flow within the not so zen of its administrative skeleton. So I guess where I'm standing is at a place of social design theory and multimodal employment, a culture hacker at a culture center, inscribing circles within the institution, dancing a little bit of everywhere, twirling in the midst of a standstill sandstorm of social polemic and economic quaking, a breach among the people intent on being changed by community, like how my poems Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Thank, Thank you. Okay, now we're going to have a, a, a talk, um, and it's going to be moderated by Eric Ting. And Eric Ting is the Associate Artistic Director of the Long Wharf Theater in New Haven, Connecticut and recently received an Obie Award for his direction of We Are Proud to Present a Presentation at Soho Rep, a, sh a play by Jackie Sibley's Drury. Uh, you guys can all come on. Let's just go ahead and get on. I'll just keep talking. Um, his other credits include Miriam at the BAM Next Wave. <laughs> uh, and he also directed at the Goodman, the Alliance, ART, Long War Theater, Singapore Rep Theater. And also, Eric did um, every post-show discussion at Long Wharf, and they do one almost every night of their shows for seven years. Uh, he is a rising star director. I'm really proud to have him here, and he's also my professional son-in-law. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Um, I'm going to be very uh, conscious of time because I know we're going to break for coffee at 11.30 and some of us need to be away. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, such inspiring words. Um, I, think, I, think, I think what I want to talk about today a little bit was courage. Um, and in part, I've been drawn to this question of the, the last 10 years, that, that we've been, that this festival's been around for 10 years and, and just thinking, sort of meditating on what that means, what the last 10 years means, right? That this festival is, like there's, never, there's not been a time when this country hasn't been at war during the lifetime of this festival. That there is this sense of the kind of, the scarcity that Joe mentions about like the, the, the creating, that the festival started in, you know, I guess 2005, but that the recession hit us in 2008. And, um, and to be able to sort of support artists um, in, in a space of scarcity is a very interesting thing to me as well. And um, in particular, I'm drawn to this idea of how, in times of scarcity, we often find ourselves in a state of fear. And um, many of you are presenters, I suppose, and I think um, many of us here in this room drank the Kool-Aid of Under the Radar years and years ago. 
Um, and this idea of being willing to present work that surprises us, right? That, um, that changes the way that we see things. And what, what does it mean for you in that context to be brave in a time of scarcity, to be sort of courageous in that? Does that, does that lead us to anything? <laughs> Maybe not. No, please. And feel free to completely disagree with me. Um, I'm going to start. Um, so um, I think that scarcity is um, something that um, can be mind-numbing and can be um, totally um, paralyzing. And that um, part of the reason that um, I wanted to really do this kind of work from the very first time that I was um, exposed to it is because it spoke to me at a level that um, more traditional work just hadn't. And, and I think that what uh, I've been very uh, adept at doing is at any position that I'm <coughs> in, whether it's as, it's as a presenter or as a funder or as an uh, agency leader in the local arts agency movement, it's about being present and being part of the solution and being part of creating the resources that will make this work um, really come to life. And so it is a personal commitment that I've made and I think many people in this room find themselves at that same crossroads, that you make personal sacrifices, you really rattle cages, and um, it's all worth it when the lights go down and you see extraordinary work. And sometimes it really sucks, the work, you know? <laughs> and then you have to just kind of, you know, muddle through and, you know, keep thinking you're not gonna lose the funding, but um, it's really important to be able to give artists that wide berth that not every, Thing that you see on stage is going to be a hit. Not everything is going to speak to you. You really need to give people the opportunity to make mistakes or to explore areas that might not speak to you, but they deserve that audience and they deserve that communion. So for me, it's really um, about um, facing scarcity and just saying, I will not succumb to it. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, it's interesting. Did you want to say something? Um, I'm going to force it to you right now. But, um, so it's interesting because I think in this conversation about scarcity, right, I think that one of the things that keeps coming up is that I'm in that state of fear. It's harder and harder and harder to see far, right, that we're, we're caught up in the moment a little bit. We get caught up in the moment. And I was struck, and I was, and I was struck by what you were saying, Joe, about this idea of, um, of actually focusing on the moment. That as much as we talk about the last 10 years and as much, as much as we may talk about the next 10 years or the next 10 hundred years, right, um, what you were talking about was this idea of focusing on the moment, of being sort of where we are now, and what is the, our responsibility now to the people, and not getting and not getting sort of um, overwhelmed by a sense of what we need to be doing. Um, yeah, uh, I can't do this and stuff. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know. It's hard to know anything. I, uh, you know, I mean, right now we know in this country that you know corporations are sitting on more cash than they've ever sat on. So we're in this economic recovery. We haven't quite recovered. They're sitting on record amounts of cash. You know, they're 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 a scarcity mindset. They're keeping their arms around it because they don't know what's going to come next. And if we can extend that analogy to what some of our creative organizations are doing, you know, we're doing this with our resources a little bit. We're doing it with our creative. We're doing it with our imaginations. We're thinking smaller than we might. Otherwise, and I guess you know, in, in, in thinking about what we need to do right now, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know, and you, you feel like maybe giving any kind of, you wrestle with it the way you need to wrestle with it. I just encourage us that on some level, in our imaginations and our creativity, we are sitting on record amounts of cash, you know, and 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 what we do with those resources and how we apply them daily, as opposed to saving that for some other better time. Uh, I guess is what seems important to me. I, I think maybe I want to uh, jump in by saying, um, one, that my parents are from Haiti. I'm a first generation American. And <coughs> I'm, I'm a child of hip hop. And so, um, you know, I'm not alone in this something from nothing background. I was struck at a recent um, staff retreat 
um, among senior leadership at, at YBCA, there was um, a common current of striving among us all. No one um, came from a place of privilege. Um, all of us were our misfits. Um, this is a field of thinking left of center and moving from a, a place of um, productivity as survival. And so, um, you know, to the point of where we've been over the course of the last 2,000 years, to the point of the, um, the saliency and the, and the resilience of the field, the field is dominated by salient, resilient people. We don't enter, it, we are all of an intellect where we probably could be stupid rich if we chose. <laughs> but we choose not. And so the field persists because we do, because of the collective character that we have, that, um, that the art that we make, that we gravitate towards, comes from a same place, from a place of lack and of question and of inquiry. And I think that might be the secret sauce. It's not so much about the hoarding, it's genetic. And socially, it, uh, it's, it's part of the social DNA that makes up the feel that we're talking about. So does that, is that kind of that idea of, of, of scarcity and sacrifice and like I, there's all these interesting words that are for me very charged, right? About sort of the, the kind of fringe, like the like this this idea of the fringe festival, right? And the work that's being created with nothing, right? And that idea that it's coming out of a place of scarcity. And what you were talking about, which was about living in that space of fragility, do you know? And I think where does like where do those voices come from, and how do those voices speak to us as a as a kind of a different perspective, perhaps from like who our audiences are? And what do you mean when you say? Um, audience development and community development. Um, where, where does that where does that take us? And, and I think one of the things, Mark, that your festival does is it, it sort of like in this whole conversation about <coughs> locality and creating community, right? And and not not um, underestimating your audiences, right? Which is also maybe not under, under, underestimating your community. Well, um, I, I, it's not that it's not about underestimating audiences as such. It's about underestimating uh, us in, as as people. Uh, we, it's sort of fashionable, or maybe just biochemical. I'm not quite sure. We're always a bit hard on ourselves. We're we're, we're pretty self-critical um, generally. It's part of our success, I think, as a species and as people. And I, I, uh, I don't know, I often have to think, you know, the, the, the Buddhists often talk about how violence begets violence. Um, and yet, if you consider the, the massive war making that we've indulged in as a, you know, uh, for, for, for thousands of years, on that rule, then we would live in a, an awful war making bloody place. We wouldn't sit here in, in relative safety. Um, Okay, violence does beget violence, but there is also something in us which must cut across it somehow, mysteriously, individually, collectively, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here in relative peace. All through time and history, we something in us has, has not just fought back an eye for an eye, we've also absorbed and made violence go away. But we don't talk about that much. We always beat ourselves up about how rotten we are, how awful, how we are a mean species, we, <coughs> how we don't care about uh, this and we don't care about that. And um, I don't know, I was having a conversation last night uh, with some friends about how I, I lost my wallet in a taxi in New York a couple of years ago and how um, after seven hours and being helped by very many people who I didn't know that were strangers to me, I got it back with everything still in it. It passed from hand to hand and how for every dishonest person there are very many honest people. And I think that's something also that I, I like about our environment, that we are free to reflect in, on the full breadth of us. So I don't feel, I mean okay, it's a, it's an economic crisis and everyone's got a, uh, uh, probably a tough moment, 
but I mean, we are we're phenomenally wealthy collectively and mostly individually. We are we're all. I mean, I'm, I'm a millionaire, not in my cash, but in how I feel. I was born in a lucky place. I'm born in '61. I'm white. I'm European. I've fought no wars. I've I, I'm, I'm, I'm I don't fear for my children's safety. I I don't have to do all those things. Look in the history books. It's all in there. Uh, we we are amongst the 0.001% of the most privileged creatures ever to have walked the face of the earth. And we're still beating ourselves up about the things that we're not. And I think we need to balance that out with things that we are as well. Um, can I ask you in the last few minutes that we have, three minutes, three minutes, and I don't know if we're, we're probably not set up for questions, but um, I'm gonna just ask you really quickly, which is, um, as we talk about these artists and the supporting these artists, right? And I think I think there's not a person in this room that would disagree that that um, real courage begins there, right? The, the individuals that are sort of fearless and that are making the work um, and that are existing in that space of fragility are the artists, and I think that's why um, Olga, you started what you started. Uh, where do we ten years ten years past? Where do we look next? That's the question. <laughs> Where do we go next? Where do we look next? Where do we look next? Or... <laughs> <laughs> Which we? Well, that's also good. That's good. That's a good answer. What else? <laughs> Trippy thing. This uh, this this piece, uh, War Becomes Flesh, is um, uh, pretty close to the bone for me um, biographically. It's about the um, pregnancy from a father's perspective, and it's about my son Makai, who is now 12 and wears the same shoe size that I do. <laughs> <laughs> He, you know, he just celebrated his 12th birthday, and you know, and I look at him and don't know where the time went. And the arc of that particular piece, in a lot of ways, frames the arc of our relationship, and in in a very real way, has kind of formed um, some of the economic frame in which my family exists. So, you know, I, I think that you always look to your close personal history. That in terms of um, artists um, opening up or, you know, creating some beach <coughs> by which some, you know, magical tunnel by which we can navigate the, the future of the field, I, I think that that's a misstep. I, I think that the closer that we cut to um, the marrow of our being, um, rather than looking externally, the, the more likely it is that we'll continue to um, work in such a way that's human. And part, you know, part of what you know I got from Joe's remarks in, in particular is that the field is not so much in distress um, or is only in as much distress as we are. Um, it, again, to, you know, to quote most deaf, you, you know, hip hop isn't some giant in, in the hills. It's who we are, it's what we do. So I don't think that we need to look externally. I think that we just need to fortify ourselves. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, 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 I really appreciate those words, Mark. I think that's uh, on, on the personal level and on the artistic level that seems so right. Uh, to just think about the organizational perspective over the next 10 years and what what uh, what maybe needs to be thought about. You know, there's I've become interested in this idea of the uh, the inverted U curve. You know, where where the very same thing that allows us to be successful can be the thing 
which, which enforces our demise. So if we think of money in this relative to our organizations, and I run a producing organization, we present a little bit, largely producing organization. When I look at the big producing organizations in the country, so, you know, without any resources, it's very hard to do good work, right? It's hard to make enough time, it's hard enough to get to, to uh, collect the fantastic artists you want to work with. So no money's a tough place. Then you get some money, it gives you time, it gives you, you're able to, to, you're able to get something. Money, imp money improves the work. And that, that goes up and up, and you can do more, you can impact a community, and you can spend that money in ways that continue to grow. And then there's some point, and some of our largest producing organizations in this country, I think, are on the far side of this inverted U curve, where the money is so great, it has become so much, that they can no longer afford to do the work that very small companies can afford to do. So when you have, we do a lot of classical, we do a lot of uh, classical work where we are, and you know, when I hear of a $30 million uh, producing organization, that can't afford to do a Shakespeare unless it's something that's on the high school curriculum because they can't afford to because they need all those thousands of kids to come through their doors so they can't make the play. And in a theater at the scale of ours, we can do a, you know, whatever, a Pericles or a Simply. Those are plays that, that our largest organizations cannot do. So in this inverted U curve, I think where a lot of, of so much of the theatrical capital in this country is held is in some of these very large organizations who that money has to feed the machine so much that not enough of that is getting out to artists, is not enough of that is getting back out uh, uh, to meaningfully impact the community. And uh, anyway, I think, so I think that's something we need to look at going forward. Yeah. <laughs> are we good? All right. Uh, oh, we are at the end of our time. So um, thank you for very, very much for um, just your wisdom. Break time.